And if you've been watching the past few months, we've been working our way down the ballot, bringing you interviews with candidates for governor and lieutenant governor ahead of Tuesday's primary. This week, we speak with our final candidate, New York City Public Advocate Jumani Williams. He's one of two Democrats challenging Governor Kathy Hochul for the party's nomination in this year's race for governor. We spoke this week for a final look at his campaign and more on his vision for the state. Jumani, thank you so much for coming back. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Anytime. So we haven't talked in a few months. Can you tell me what you're hearing from voters on the campaign trail in these final days? I'm curious to see what they're telling you as you're out and about. You know, we've been crisscrossing uh, across the state uh, from Brooklyn to Buffalo. Uh, you know, there are always uh, unique ecosystems and cultures of how uh, people live uh, that have to be honored and respected. But I got to tell you, the buckets of our campaign uh, generally cross all across the state the same. Public safety, housing, and the economy are all things people are worried about. And uh, we've been presenting our plan and vision of how to truly address it. So let's talk about public safety first. You've mentioned it a few times at the debates for governor, but I want to expand on it a little bit. So you have a plan to tackle gun violence in New York State. You want to invest $1 billion in the state budget to do that. Can you walk us through what that money would be used for and your plan for doing that? You know, we uh, I, I'm so proud of the work I, I did in 2012 to 2018, 2019, pre-pandemic, where we said we can actually lower this gun violence if we invest in programs and communities in a way that haven't been invested before. And it worked. We saw one of the biggest declines we'd ever seen. We were the safest we'd ever been. Now, data means nothing to you if you're a victim of crime, but we do want to look at what we're doing and see if it's working. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic hit and things have only gotten worse. What frustrated me the most was uh, those packages of legislation that people see the commercials now, they're great. Actually, I would have signed it, but they don't address the street violence that people are most concerned about. Um, just uh, recently, there was a mass shooting of a different type in Harlem where nine people were shot. Uh, the $1 billion investment will mimic and expand on the work that we did here in New York City that really addressed those problems. And it was uh, working with community groups that do violence intervention before it happens. We know our law enforcement partners, we have to work with them, and uh, we're glad that they're there to assist, but they can't do it alone. Uh, we, we funded uh, summer youth jobs in a way that they never were funded before. We funded ancillary uh, systems around the wraparound services of legal services, job training, mental health services. So what we did is the same areas that we need to send officers uh, as a response are the same areas we should send other investments. And that's not too hard to conceptualize, but for some reason, it's very hard to get people to understand how impactful it would be in the type of funding that we need. A lot of the time when we have this conversation, I feel like people choose one side or the other in terms of diverting funding to the police or diverting funding to services. Do you think that we can do both? You know, it's incredible. We wasted a, a great opportunity to talk about public safety during the George Floyd protest. So, so many people are focused on the word defund. Yeah. And I would tell everybody, you know, try to find a video of me saying that and you won't. Uh, and it was because I thought maybe it wasn't the best phrasing. At the same time, our jobs were not to tell people in pain how to express their pain and trauma in the streets. Our jobs was to take that pain and trauma and turn it into workable solutions, and we didn't. And that's because people who unfortunately are in leadership are more concerned about running for office, how do I play to my base, than actually keeping New Yorkers safe. <laughs> and so the great example I always give is, you know, most law enforcement all across the state, and certainly in New York City, has uh, unabetted access to overtime. Well, why doesn't the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Children's Services, why don't these other agencies have the same access to resources as one agency does? And that's a great way to think about this, because so many of these communities have been starved of resources directly, um, uh, been starved of agencies really providing them the service they needed for such a long time, that if we just did that, public safety looks a lot different. Instead of these men and women who come in every day, risk their lives, they're taking guns off the street, and we keep asking them, these are law enforcement officers, to do the job of all these other agencies and community groups. And that's not fair to them, and it's certainly not fair to the community. So this goes back to the state budget in some ways, in terms of spending and funding. So the state passed a $220 billion state budget in early April. I know you disagreed with that spending plan, and we don't have to go through all of it, obviously, but can you give me some top lines of what you would have done differently if you were in office this year as part of budget negotiations? I think the best question to ask 
after any session, after any budget is, are the people who needed the most help better off? And they're not. Uh, and you had a governor that decided that they wanted to stop the budget so we can get a billion dollars to a billionaire to build a stadium that's outside of Buffalo that needed the most help. What we would have done as governor is stop the budget and say, hold on, people are dying in the streets. We have to get a billion dollars for gun violence prevention, youth services, and victim services. There's uh, a few more laws that we can do, but the state laws are not as strong to deal with some of the gun violence that we have, so we have to make investments. Uh, we didn't get any good cause eviction for tenants. We didn't get any real robust program to stop foreclosures. Uh, we didn't get uh, much, we didn't get, we got zero for housing vouchers. And so we barely touched the surface of how to address the housing pain that people are feeling, how to address public safety. And we decided we're not going to raise any revenue uh, from the people who donate the largest checks. That's a problem. And that means we're moving in the wrong direction. We also haven't seen any investments when it comes to real uh, prevention of the climate change that we're seeing. The only thing we did worse than public safety and housing is actually climate change. There was no money put in for the Climate Protection Act that was passed a few years ago. We can't get a ban uh, moratorium on proof of work crypto mining, which is the worst type of mining. Uh, we have a stall now on congestion pricing. So there's so many spaces uh, where it's actually a through line between who's donating and the bad policies coming out. And that's why we need to make a change to a new direction for New York. Can we expand on housing a little bit? This seems to be the number one issue for a lot of people right now, having a place to live and being able to afford to keep the place that you're living, being able to stay there. If you were governor, what would you do about that? I hear you mentioned housing vouchers and a few other things, but what's your housing plan? How do we keep people in their homes and bring people into homes that may need them? Uh, I was an organizer around housing even before I got elected to council uh, 12 years ago. It's an issue I've been working on for a very long time. Uh, and we know people both are suffering uh, tenants and particularly small owners who are facing foreclosure. We didn't get much relief for any of them. The governor's own plan right now, right now, you look it up, it's 100,000 units uh, of uh, prevention, uh, uh, preserved and built affordable, quote unquote, affordable housing. That's not enough for one borough of New York City, much less the entirety of the state. I don't know if people understand that. We have a plan to build and preserve 1 million units of affordability over 10 years. And how we do that, no one pays more than 30% of their income and in rent. So if you make $100,000, you pay 30%. If I make $20,000, I pay 20, uh, 30%. And those prices can help cross subsidize so the building can operate. And if it can't, that's a good use of taxpayer dollars and subsidies. Not 421A, people may have never heard of it, but it's $2 billion subsidy that primarily is used to subsidize market rate housing. And so what you need is a governor who will say, we're not going to return to normal because it didn't work for you. We're going to normalize your lives, but we're going to go back better than where we were. And the status quo of Albany is how we got here, which is why our campaign is so important at this moment in time. Some of these are policy changes. Some of them are spending priorities. I know that you would like to raise taxes on the ultra wealthy here in New York above where they are already. Uh, there has been some reluctance in the legislature to do that in the past year. What would you do as governor if you were in budget negotiations and you just can't get that yes from the legislature on that? How do you move forward without those higher taxes on the wealthy if the legislature prevents it? Well, I don't know if it was more the legislature or the governor prioritized what she wanted to prioritize. And so last year, in uh, uh, sitting in a room full of wealthy billionaires and millionaires, she said, I don't want to raise any taxes because I want you to come back. I'm not going to raise your taxes. I want you to come back to New York. Well, one, they haven't left. We know one left. He's orange, uh, orange hair. He lives in Mar-a-Lago. I believe he could stay there. Uh, most of the people who have left simply can't afford to live here. What also is deceptive is that we're not going to raise taxes is a Republican line that's used to protect wealthy donors at the expense of people who are trying to find a place to live, who can't find baby formula, who can't find food for their children, who can't afford to pay for food. This is the expense that we have to pay and New Yorkers are suffering right now. And so what we are saying is, this is just stop saying about not raising taxes. We're talking about revenue raises off of people who make, and this is it. If you make less than a million dollars, uh, and this is after you paid everything you need to pay. If you make less, if you bring home less than a million dollars, we're not speaking to you at all, and primarily, a lot of it has to do with billionaires. People may not even know, 120 billionaires in the state made $220 billion, the size of the budget, during this pandemic. 
while evictions are up, foreclosures are up, the people are benefiting off of the struggles of, of most New Yorkers. We simply can't have it. And so it's about having a conversation of civic responsibility. And we have to have it because even some of the good things that are in the budget, like childcare, they expand over four to seven years. And that means when our money came out, that, that one-time money from the federal government, in the next couple of years, when we lose that money, if we don't raise the revenue, we're going to cut. And by then it'll be too late because the election will be over. You know, you touched on it, but New Yorkers are struggling uh, in some ways more than ever because of inflation, the price of gasoline, especially in upstate New York there. It, you know, you touched on some things that you may do about that, but can you walk me through what you would do if you were governor right now? I know the state has cut the gas tax to some extent, but there isn't a lot of relief out there other than that for people in New York right now. What would you do if you were governor? And if you talk to people who drive uh, and ask them if they felt the impact of that gas tax, they have not. Because, they have uh, not. I sure have not, and I drive. <laughs> hasn't, even, hasn't even changed. Uh, and uh, even if you did, I have to tell you, it wouldn't be as much as you thought it would be. Uh, it is really one of those political ploys that are done close to election time, like some of the homeowner rebates that people may have gotten uh, with the, the governor's name on it. It's really a ploy at election time to purchase votes. Uh, but it doesn't really impact New Yorkers. And we want to impact New Yorkers. So what we suggested and recommended is that everybody's dealing with something. Drivers, people take mass, tra uh, mass transit, homeowners and tenants, people are struggling, they're paying. Why not get a rebate for all New Yorkers? Give them some money back so they can have it in their pocket. But that is something you do if you actually care about all New Yorkers. If you're focused on who best is going to vote for me and when, what we have is what we get. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes that works, but we're presenting a, a different alternative for that. Uh, we saw people uh, last time um, just vote for someone who was already in the office. It didn't work out too well for us. All right, Jamani Williams, a candidate for governor in the June 28th Democratic primary and the New York City public advocate. Thank you so much. Peace and blessings. Thank you.